Let's get back to this. Um, so I don't know about other non-technical folks in the room, but I'm a business and economics major, and that panel was hoped that there's um, there's still some scope for us non-technical folks in the field of technology. Now, we heard a lot about the benefits of generative AI. Could I ask everyone to settle down in this area? We'll be starting with the next panel really soon. Amazing. Okay. Um, we heard a lot about the benefits of generative AI just now, but there is no doubt that the proliferation of ChatGPT has become the bane of, um, of many educators worldwide. And to speak about exactly that and also to address challenges in the field of education as, um, as the future is very uncertain, we have a panel on generational shifts in education with Adil Khan, who is the founder of Magic School AI. Angela, who's the director of product management at Salesforce. Jonathan, who's the head of product growth at OpenAI itself. And moderated by Qian, who is a partner at Reach Capital. We're going to get order. Does this work? Okay. Do you mind maybe? All right, thank you all so much for being here. Um, just as to set the stage a little bit, uh, we are gonna be chatting a little bit about where everyone sees education going next and how generative AI um, and AI more generally can influence that. Um, and I'm really thrilled to have three of you here with us today. Um, and just to, to set the stage and give people a little bit of context um, about REACH, first of all. REACH, we are an early stage education technology focused venture fund. We invest seed to series B, love working with Berkeley entrepreneurs. So if you're building something and looking for funding or even just feedback, feel free to reach out. Um, and just jumping in, I, I think, why are we even talking about this topic? Uh, I think pretty much everyone in this room probably has touched on ChatGPT or some other element of generative AI and is wondering kind of what is the implication? Just to put some numbers behind it, um, a report from Common Sense Media in May said that about 50% of kids 12 to 18 reported using ChatGPT in school, while only 30% of parents actually even thought their kids were using it. Uh, <laughs> and I bet that this is from May, and there's probably been a lot more adoption since then, since the start of the school year, and so that, that data is probably pretty stale. But it gives you a sense of just like how quickly this has shifted the education landscape. Uh, before we dive into the deeper discussion, I'd love to actually turn it over to each of you to just quickly share a little bit about yourself, where you work, what brings you to this topic, um, and I, we'll come back to you in a little bit to hear a little bit about your journey as well, since many of these folks in the audience are thinking about their career and where they go next and would love to hear from your journey. So starting off with name, what you're doing, and why it relates to education. Uh, my name is Adil Khan. I'm the founder and CEO of Magic School AI. It's uh, generative AI for teachers, kind of like the co-pilot for educators, K-12, but we have a lot of higher education users as well. Um, and I'm building a generative AI first product in the education space. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Lee. I'm a director of product at Salesforce. And in about two weeks, I'll be working full-time on our Salesforce uh, co-pilot product and uh, I'm here today because I also worked at Kip Bay Area Schools for many years and opened uh, schools throughout the Bay Area so uh, as a first generation college student education very very near and dear to my heart. Hey I'm Jonathan um, I lead product for growth at OpenAI and as many of you can imagine um, education is a big growth sector for us and it's actually one of our first areas that we're thinking about as a specific vertical so that's why I'm here. Awesome. So maybe just to, to set the stage, I think we can talk about Gen AI in like three different ways. We can talk about it in the ways in which it actually impacts our day-to-day, -day, our work, like how has it changed your life? Um, then we can talk about kind of how it's shaping kind of your, your work and your organization. And I think it's very distinct for each of you, right? I think you saw this technology and you were like, this should be in the hands of teachers and I'm gonna build a product around it. Angela, I think Salesforce is like one of the biggest software companies in the world and is thinking about and has been thinking about for quite some time like how AI influences that and of course I think <laughs> you're why we're having this conversation in the first place right now uh, it took ChatGPT took the world by storm um, 
So just starting off, maybe let's let's start with a little bit about your day to day uh, and how you see AI in your workflows. So again, as like an AI first product, we. Uh, we certainly encourage the use of AI <laughs> across like the organization uh, from the engineering team to uh, to the you know our product team. We I would say that like in my day to day work, I mean my story is only possible probably through the age of AI. Quite frankly, I'm a lifelong teacher and principal. Prior to doing this, I have no software experience whatsoever, um, and we built a generative AI platform that launched in May and now has half a million users five months later. Um, and a lot of that journey has been me being really resourceful um, and AI being a work partner in that resourcefulness. So like all of the things that you guys probably know really, really well uh, as engineers uh, or as product people or as venture capitalists, like I had no idea about, but I had ChatGPT as a fantastic explainer uh, and teacher to me as I was going. So, um, you know, I have used ChatGPT along my journey from being a legal advisor I know that, like you know, uh, on this panel, there's someone saying, "Don't hold me," you know, to to the T on that. But like as like a good legal counsel, uh, it's been great uh, for learning how to you know retain users, getting strategies around that. To uh, one of the most interesting use cases was where like you know, I know that other software products do these drip emails to like engage users after they sign up to make sure that they come back. And ChatGPT gave me a really great schedule of drip, drip email suggestions for our product. So I started there and I'd never done that before, but it's a really fantastic, like I was able to get up to speed extraordinarily fast on things I have just about no idea about. Um, so I think that like all of that to illustrate the idea that like the, the future is in the hands of the resourceful with generative AI. Yeah. And I think that has been a huge part of our story is that ChatGPT gives you this opportunity to be resourceful um, in a way that you know, even Google might have been the corollary prior to the generative AI world, but still required more work. But you can be so specific about what you need with generative AI that uh, you, know, you, can, you can build and you can, can ramp up really fast in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, so for me, kind of similar actually, because I'm in product management now, but I switched from strategy and operations. And so, um, I mean, in my daily workflow, there's sometimes really technical product uh, or sorry, technical engineering things that I want to, concepts I want to understand, and I work on a platform product. So it's very like back end heavy infrastructure. And so there's numerous times where I want to know, okay, like, why is all this auth token important and explain it to me like I'm five or you know, things like that. Why it just helps me ramp up so much faster. And I feel pretty confident in what I am able to do and, and able to have those conversations with um, engineering leaders across my organization as well. Um, and then I think that was mostly a question, right? Like, yeah. yeah. So you'd think being at OpenAI, I have like a super advanced, something different that I use GPT for, but it's very similar. Um, I only joined OpenAI in September of this year, and before that I was at Meta. And what GPT really has helped us do, at Meta, the growth team was 300 engineers, you had data scientists, growth marketers, content strategists, you had a person for every function. At OpenAI, the growth team is me and one engineer. And so our data scientist is me figuring out, like inputting SQL errors into ChatGPT and it spits out the right SQL query so I can figure out how many users we have in Indonesia. Or translating you know, samples from users to see like how are people actually using the product. So that serves as our UX researcher. Or you know, a lot of the UI that we have, we don't have any content strategists right now in um, the applied organization. So that's basically all written by ChatGPT and then just vetted by designers. And so it becomes all the things you're not good at, uh, GPT is a very useful backstop and starting place uh, for getting things done. Love that. Uh, I'd love to shift a little bit more to how you know, the latest advances in AI have shaped your worldview and also kind of what you're working on. I feel like I've heard a number of career shifts recently, so maybe you can start <laughs> from this side and come over, but I think everyone has made a change in the last year. <laughs> Yeah, so I started the year as a skeptic. Um, you know, ChatGPT had come out. I was working at Meta. We were working on Llama at the time. Uh, it was considered, you know, a year to a year and a half behind what OpenAI had developed. 
And I think for a lot of initial use cases, it's very difficult to discern, is this just another Markov chain generator or actually something meaningfully different? And I think a lot of you can probably relate. Like The first couple of queries you put into ChatGPT, you're like, why does this matter? And if I can write a Shakespearean poem about you know, why the sky is blue, does that mean anything different? And it wasn't until I was getting dinner with someone who was working on a startup that I invested in. They'd been working on it for the past three years. And they're like, Jonathan, my startup is dead. It's all going to be replaced by LLMs. And my new strategy is to either go work at OpenAI or anywhere working on an LLM because that's all that matters in my field. And it just surprised me to see, and this was someone that I really respected and thought was really smart. And I'm like, okay, this is not just writing Shakespeare poems, but like entire industries are being changed by this. And that's what sort of led me to start going down the rabbit hole. And then I didn't stop after that. Yeah, I mean, at Salesforce, it's been just completely and say how quickly everyone has. And it's not just, I think sometimes in tech we're like, oh, it's the new shiny thing, but it's really feels generationally shifting um, to have something that's so conversational and also very approachable. So I think um, a lot of what my day-to-day -day is thinking about is like how will our users and like how do we help businesses help their customers um, make this more approachable and help them have capture more value from their time and and almost I don't like to say automate like the mundane but it, it is a little bit of that so you can spend that time on higher order thinking and like thinking about things that are more strategic or can have outsized impact um, but a lot of what I think keeps me up at night or kind of what I really worry about is um, you know is is this the whatever is being spit out is it the right thing and do we not have too much confidence in it and um, because I think trust is such a big thing and we say that at Salesforce all the time like trust is our number one value and it's become even more uh, important because our customers and our users are really relying on us to make sure we're we're not having um, the model hallucinate and give wrong answers because if you're not an expert in it you will trust that it is the right thing and make the wrong decision so that really um, that's something that really scares me. Uh, a lot of that resonates from from both of you. I think that uh, again, like as a career shifter and a non uh, software person, that that's obviously my whole my whole my life's changed in a really big way. I uh, didn't think I'd be at Berkeley at an engineering uh, conference uh, six months ago. Um, but but beyond that, I think that the thing that is more interesting to me, and like I think this was said earlier on the panel, is that like how can software solve problems has been really fascinating to me. And like generative AI unlocks like a whole new set of problems that were once intractable that can now be potentially like solved for or like helped. So, you know, education to me is such an obvious use case in the sense that like in the American education system and every education system in the country experiences this exists to some degree, is there's an enormous teacher shortage. Um, and there's a crisis of teacher burnout and teachers leaving the profession because of all of the reasons that we know that educators uh, are underappreciated and overworked. Uh, but you know, education is one field, but there's also things that we know like that are just social issues, challenges, and they might not, might not be the sexiest use cases of AI, but are to me really compelling. I always, the, the example I use, and I'm waiting for one of you to build a startup around this, is like the Department of Veterans Affairs. Like there is this enormous queue of paperwork there um, that is preventing our veterans from getting the care that they need. And we've known this my entire lifetime, and there are veterans who are dying because they don't get the support that they need. And AI could be agents to do those kinds of things. And why it doesn't happen is primarily because of the lack of government spending and the need there. So like AI is much less costly than a human agent doing that. So how can we solve some of these like intractable problems that have been intractable? Like it feels like I've heard about that since I was a kid. Um, and that can just be, I think, another way to think about is like, what are the problems in the world, and how does generative AI maybe solve problems that we didn't think were were solvable um, now that we have this new technology? I love that. Um, and for what it's worth, I feel like education has been one of those intractable challenges. Um, I think a lot of bright spots and a lot of conversations around what should change, how should it change, and so I'd love to spend this next time really talking about kind of how you think education will change in this moment. Uh, so maybe just kicking things off, I'd love to hear from an educator perspective, what's been the biggest impact on teaching and instruction so far from your perspective? 
So when I founded the school that I founded, uh, which is kind of my dream manifest, um, it, the, the thing I told the teachers who came into my school was that the foundation of the school that we build will be the relationships that we keep with our students and our families. Um, and all the rest is built on top of that foundation. So the way that we love our kids, uh, the, way, the, the way that they know that we love them, the way that we take interest in them, the way that we support their dreams. Um, and we're gonna be really intentional about that. Our, our school is the top performing public high school in Denver. It's in the top 1% of schools in the country and it serves primarily low income kids. So it, it was, I think, pretty inarguably very, very successful. Um, and my teachers had to take superhuman efforts to do that, right? Like not only were they holding really high standards in their curriculum, building a really amazing curriculum personalized to their students, they were also spending the time outside of class going to their students' football games, baseball games, uh, taking that student in the hallway to take a walk around the building after having a really tough class period. Um, and my, you know, the, the future vision of that is every school can be like that because a lot of that stuff that was taking superhuman efforts can be lightened, that load can be lightened, and that human connection can take, uh, take a greater hold in all schools. Um, so that, that's, that's where I, I see, like, as you're able to build a classroom resource, you're able to have a first draft of an individualized education plan for a student with special needs, then you're able to say, let me take that extra time to help that student with financial aid and that family that's first generation who doesn't understand anything about college, let me make that call home to support them. Let me, for that student who's struggling and didn't say a word today in class, I can take them aside and, and check in with them and make sure that they're good. So I love the idea of AI as a social connection piece because it takes away a lot of the things that are preventing us from having those deep relationships. <coughs> like to comment please do but also no pressure I'd like to keep moving yeah so I think for me what I think is most exciting is yeah a lot of there's some like the paperwork stuff right but then there's meeting kids where they are and that personalization piece so um, one of the things I think is could be really exciting um, one of the products we have is it's called trailhead and it's a way for people who might not have a college degree to get certifications to work in the Salesforce ecosystem, kill them either a developer or admin or something like that. And um, in meeting with people where they are, if you have an AI that can really see those patterns, like pull up suggestions, like where are you missing, like where do you need more help, or like searching content is always so cumbersome that if I just want an answer to this and, and ChatGPT is so good at this, it's like, how do I build a component this way? And I don't understand why something is connecting or why it's not working. Um, I think that's really powerful and it's a way for people to ramp um, on difficult topics in a way that is not has not been available before. Um, but from the elementary through high school perspective, I think that I'm really excited for that. And the, the only thing I'm thinking really then it's like, how do we teach our children to be, um, like to build the right prompts and ask the right questions? Like it's really then about critical thinking skills to get them to use that tool uh, in a very meaningful way. Yeah, echoing on what Angela said, the thing that I'm really excited about is the ability to use GPTs as a means of curriculum design. And so when I say that, I actually mean that in the broadest sense, that uh, this might mean self-learning of creating your own curriculum. What does it mean to actually break something down step by step? It might mean a teacher actually intentionally using GPTs to create a curriculum that actually matters for a student. And having this system that can take a lot of um, what used to have to be intellectual load on like the one teacher interfacing with multiple students and actually offloading that into like a GPU cloud so that then you know the teacher can take on higher order things. And one thing is like, I would actually hope that GPTs are gonna be what makes filling out the FAFSA um, a lot easier. That was actually one of the use cases we were talking about yesterday uh, for education. I love that. Um, and just, I know we've been talking about like hypothetically what could change, but I think it's also worth just noting it's already shifting. There was a study from the Walton Family Foundation released this summer that indicated 63% of teachers say they've used ChatGPT for their job, and 40% of them are using it at least once a week. And that was before the school year, where I think there's been a lot more on-ramp and a lot of new tools that really help teachers access ChatGPT. So it's really exciting just to see that it's already starting to happen. And it's just the early innings, but I think there's a lot more to come. I think, Angela, you touched on this question of like, 
in this new context? How does this shift education? Like, what do we need to learn? Like, what are the skills that are going to be valued? Um, and what should we be teaching for future generations? I'd love to kind of start from the other end and, and hear folks' perspectives there. Yeah, so for me, when I was at Meta, I started like new grad and you know worked my way through managing a small team managing teams of teams and you know sort of deeply mid-level management where i had like five layers below me five layers above me and it was like 400 people and going through that process you sort of you realize you have to start abstracting tasks away and it's not how can i write this essay myself it's how can i help someone else write a quality essay and then it's like how can i write how can i help someone else teach someone else to write a quality essay and then it becomes how can i help someone create a culture so that others can teach other people to write a quality essay and so i think the thing that changes with uh, gpts is it echoes that sort of ladder that you go through from being an individual contributor to a manager now you don't have to worry about the emotional aspect of managing people but all of a sudden you have like an infinite army of interns that can do all these intellectually demanding tasks, but you still have, you have a different set of problems. And now it's like, how do I help these interns do a good job writing these things and sort of higher level tasks that still need to be done? Yeah, I think for me, I mentioned um, yeah, just being able to think cr more critically. I think it also gets down to also like, root causing what it is that you're trying to solve and being able to think in that way. Um, so you actually know what, what problem is it that I'm trying to solve? Is it I'm trying to build a, an IDP, since you brought up the management example, like an individual development plan that's specific to that person. Can I put in those inputs uh, in that way to set, describe them and what what makes them excited and motivated to, to build, give me something that's really uh, actionable. But yeah, I think it's, teaching those higher order skills, I'm sure as a teacher, you feel like it's it's not easy. It's not just like, oh, multiplication. It's really teaching students to think critically is probably one of the hardest things and asking those questions and continuing to the five whys until you get to the root of it. Yeah, and, and to go off that, I think you're right, is that so much of the time we spend is on the uh, you know, like the basic level skills until you can get to the higher level, and then you spend only so much time on that higher level thinking. So I think the idea is if everyone's floor is raised to the level of like a chat GPT writing, then you can spend a lot more time on these higher level thinking skills. Uh, as a principal, I visited High Tech High in San Diego, which is like a very like you know, renowned project-based learning school, and my school's promise to our kids was we were gonna get you a really good score on the SAT, and uh, that means you're going to be really good at math. You're going to be really good at writing. And I, I can words that came out of my math what mouth when I was a principal was you know you can have really amazing ideas, but if you can't communicate them through your writing, then um, you know no one's going to be able to know them. And five years later, I don't know that that's true anymore, right? So like you might be able to communicate those really amazing ideas through generative AI. Uh, without having really clear writing skills or really amazing uh, an ability to do that. So so what does that mean? To me, it means that like being really resourceful, being an a like having agency is probably the most important thing. And uh, I reference uh, High Tech High because that is the primary thing that they teach is agency, is that you're doing a project-based learning assignment on a team, you are learning leadership skills, you're learning how to collaborate. So things that we've always talked about in education that we should be doing more of, but there's this thing in the way of like, we also need you to have these base level skills. We need you to be able to do well on your SAT so you can get into colleges like UC Berkeley. Um, those things are not, and like, you know, with the pandemic taking away a lot of the tests, like test optional in places. So what do you write on your college, uh, you know, letter of intent? You write, the things you've done. So I imagine that high school is a place where you do a lot more actual things. You have a portfolio of work that is really compelling. You directed a movie, a real like full length movie with generative AI tools, right? Like you could do that in high school. Like that is such a cool, inspiring future. I, I like. I think. I think five years from now we will see a Hollywood production level movie from a fourteen year old kid that we can watch in theaters, right? Like why not? They're the most creative people I've ever been around. My high school kids are the most creative kids I know. But the only thing that was the barrier was their ability to get the resources to build those things. So like, that's the feature I'm like super excited about is what kids can build and uh, how we unlock their creativity and give them a, a, a stage. I love that. That's super exciting to think about. I'm going to switch to you kind of maybe the, the darker side that people often want to talk about, uh, which is just how do you think about Know, proper and ethical usage of AI and education. Like, what are you most 
worried about as you think about kind of anytime there's something new and there's a lot of adoption that's messy, like what are the things you're on the lookout for? How do you think about that in education? I think it was said is that like, it is so good even in this current forum that it can lull you into the sense that I should just use this and it is correct. Even with like the warnings that are abound uh, that you know, all the generative AI tools say, I think it's commonly known, at least amongst power users, that, um, that you know, there's hallucinations, there are, you know, things that are not quite correct, but I, I fear for that in, in education. I think that I just echo your sentiment that, like, you need to check over it. These tools are powerful, um, and we need to be thoughtful in the human in the loop type things. And there's so many, a lot of generative AI products in education are talking about, like, you know, eliminating teachers, and I just think that is like, th that is backwards. It is the opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, is that human in the loop, like educators being at the center of a kid's universe and still being the experts, uh, critical for, for this to not like get out of hand. Um, I read this really great book. It's actually written by a Berkeley professor, uh, Stuart Russell, about um, human compatible, I think is the name of the book. And it talks a lot about how do you, the science fiction extreme version of like what could go wrong is that humans, forget how it works and how to go back in the loop and like have that expertise of is this information correct or not and so I think about that a lot and I think um that's what I worry about too is really you forget there's there are no more experts in like objectively what is uh true or false information and um so that's kind of worrying for me but that's a very extreme science fiction example but I I love science fiction, so I can't stop thinking about that. Um, but yeah, I think there's that piece, and then um, yeah, I think there's like a level of comfort of like, okay, well, there. I also, I, one thing you were talking about st uh, student essays, and it's a, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion. I'm still forming it about if you use ChatGPT to write your student essay, is that okay? And I, I don't know. It's probably something for everyone to decide, and I'm sure universities are also thinking a lot about that too. Yeah, I would echo a lot of that sentiment. I think it's it's about um, making sure that, we, we used to have very good shibboleths to determine whether something was high quality and whether it was well-researched, and I think a lot of those former tools we have all of a sudden have gone out the window, and I think it's, it's much more impactful than just you know bringing the invention of the calculator to math, because you know, the calculator could only solve a certain set of things, whereas, you know, GPTs can put together answers that are at least bullshit level quality for almost any question. And so how do we evolve the way we're thinking to really start thinking on a higher level and interrogate and pick apart those assumptions and say, not treat it like a black box, but from an educational perspective, be able to validate that entire chain of reasoning. Um, and I think that's both something that uh, at least within OpenAI we're working on, um, but I also think it's gonna get, be a key part of education overall. So I totally don't have a lot of time left. Uh, so quick lightning round, would love to hear the most surprising use case for GPD that you've encountered so far. It could be in your own experience, it could be something you've observed in your users, whatever you want. So this was in UX research. Um, someone was flirting back and forth with someone they had met the previous night, and they were using GPT to craft the perfect text response uh, with the right emojis that they should respond to You know, someone that they had a very good night with last night. And it gave reasonably good answers. Man, mine is gonna sound so lame after. <laughs> Because <laughs> I um, I was doing this training and uh, this professor teaches product management at Kellogg. He did he built basically built an entire pitch deck um, from a product perspective for a VC for I think it was like smart walks or something. And he said it did in two hours. It was so detailed to the level like it had total addressable market. How you would mark how you do marketing and everything else. It was so detailed. Um, and I, I was a I was completely, my mind was blown. And I was like, okay, I guess I won't have a job in two, a year or so. Uh, one of the tools on our platform is a sports practice generator. So like we had a, a teacher come to us who's a middle school teacher. She's like, I, I've never coached soccer before. I'm just doing this for the good of, you know, our school to have a soccer team. And like, I get to the end of the day, I'm exhausted and I have no idea how to run practice. And I was like, well, I wonder if 
we can build a prompt for you that helps you <laughs> run a practice in school. And that's actually one of like our most used tools for teachers is like this actually happens all over the place. Like your middle school soccer coach is probably not, their passion is probably teaching and they're just doing that because they want to do it. So sometimes these like mundane things that you're like, you're doing, you can improve the way you're doing them very significantly. The second one is uh, we have a, um, we have a school district we're deployed with in Colorado that uh, they have an AI steering committee in their district. and. There's a teacher who told me that they were sitting in the back of a classroom and struggling to come up with the next, uh, an instructional coach sitting in the back of the classroom, struggling to come up with the next step for the teacher to improve their practice. She's like, I didn't just know how to word it. So I asked, you know, ChatGPT, how can I word this in a way that's really clear to this teacher to help them improve their practice? And she was like, the next step was so much better than what I would have thought of myself. So super cool, like the assist is so powerful. I love it. Um we have maybe a minute or two uh, for questions. If we'll maybe do one or two, Max. Oh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Oh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Why did I, <laughs> my mistake. We've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, it sounds like there's a way to submit them directly or no. Okay. Uh, I see one so far, but I'm also happy to take questions from the audience. I see a couple of hands popping up. Uh, uh, maybe it'll be those two. Uh, you want to start here in the front? The um, black shirt? Yeah. So one of the questions I had is that one of the concerns that larger companies are facing when it comes to generative AI is that when it gives you, for example, a code snippet for like an engineering problem, they're not, we're not exactly sure where that code snippet comes from. So this creates like a legal implication of like, who owns that piece of code and like, can, do we have the intellectual property rights to use it? So I'm curious how you guys are dealing with those kind of issues. Unfortunately, if there were a lawyer to my left, I would hand it to them and be like, this is your department. I don't really know, is the answer. Yeah, I, I, on my engineering teams, we haven't used uh, too much of it, but then at the same time, when you're talking colloquially with engineers, they're like, well, we also use Stack Overflow a lot to like answer code questions, so like, who owns that, right? Like, so I, I, don't, I don't think, we don't have a policy or anything, but I just, yeah kind of punt that to legal as well. Um, maybe directly behind you. Yeah, so my name is Logan. I'm working on Nive and all of one site management for schools for data from. Mm -hmm. And so on the topic of hallucinations and whatnot, in terms of our educators, there's a fair bit of areas that we need in terms of technical literacy, both in the Bay Area and outside of that. And so in, again, with regards to hallucinations and accuracy and whatnot, that's obviously incredibly important to all the new curriculum and the highest standards of the world. <coughs> and so what's the proposed kind of call it go to market strategy Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think that one thing that we, uh, so one, we, we are really thoughtful about the way that we onboard teachers to the platform. We, right when you join it, we give you like kind of a best practices on how to use AI before you can use the platform. You have to kind of agree to those things. We give you a tour of the product, how to use it properly before you, we like force the tour, you can't skip it. Um, so we're just, we, we want to do this really responsibly, thoughtfully. And at the same time, we got to like remember that we've always existed in a world where, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of teachers in the country, millions of teachers in the country, um, and there is a uh, quality and like you know expertise of teacher varies in a lot of different ways. And like I can tell you that as a principal, I can tell you that as a teacher who was a very low quality teacher in my first year, um, and improved over time. Um, and I think that sometimes we, uh, my, my opinion of this, and like I always honor people's perspectives who are really, you know, skeptical, worried about it, is that uh, I always, I have this conversation with school districts often, it's like, well, what if the individualized education plan, the special education plan for students, um, what if it's a little bit off? Well, I'm like, well, I've seen teachers copy paste and have the wrong name in their special education plans like that and that's far like way worse than what you know a chat gpt is actually kind of raising the floor for all of these so i think that there's there's inherent skepticism to new technology and then we get to a place where we're like okay we understand how to work this and i think the way that we we do this is actually the way that we do just about everything that we in initially ban is we then eventually teach how to use it responsibly and i think that's like the next phase here and 
and, and really important. Any, I, we can, you can think of anything in history, marijuana, whatever it is. Like it's like if you ban it, it doesn't work, and then you have all this really irresponsible usage and unhealthy circumstances that go along with it. Um, and then when you you say that okay, it's here, and let's like teach it responsibly, we see better outcomes for everyone. So. So we can. Do you want to... uh, the thing I would add is that I think one layer down we're trying to add tools that give people more of an ability to like check the work. So rather than just, you know, develop a curriculum, it's develop a curriculum, and by the way, if you want to check it against things that are available on the web, that's something you should be able to do. And finding low cost ways that are like a second order to see if, um, you know, a task was done successfully and accurately, rather than just like asking the GPT over and over. So we have a couple of questions on the live stream, but I'd encourage folks um, after this next question, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I'll come to you next. Um, so from the live stream, can Magic School AI tailor its AI curriculum specifically for vulnerable groups like unhoused youth um, who may have unique learning needs compared to other populations? Uh, super good question, and and the answer is like we are planning for for those things, and like the the nature of uh, LLMs being able to kind of like support all of these different variations of of student needs is such a compelling use of it. So um, we have teachers who like you know develop a lesson plan on the platform, and they'll say, can you give me a a version of this that is supportive to students with dys dyslexia. And you'll get some really good suggestions on how to modify that lesson plan for students with dyslexia. It still places in the hands of the teacher the final decision, but you do get some really thoughtful, um, you know, suggestions for that. So, you know, we're working toward uh, toward being able to, to do that, some, something that specific. And uh, while I don't I don't know that I've actually seen that specific use case. I think that I, I would be interested to see how it's, it, it would turn out on the platform. We're, we're launching a new version of it very soon that will give a very like similar capability. You could type that exact thing in. Um, so stay tuned. Exciting. Hey, any last questions? I have one more if that there isn't a burning question from the audience. Oh, I think I saw your hand first. Yeah, um, do you think teachers will be replaced by AI in the future? <laughs> <laughs> no. Why? Yeah, I would say absolutely not. <laughs> uh, for, for, I mean, well, from my perspective, like I, I said, uh, you know, the school that I founded, that like my fundamental philosophy in education is that no great learning happens without a great relationship. So, uh, you know, maybe there's a dystopian world where you have a great relationship with a robot, and that relationship can help you uh, learn really well. I think that. In my experience as an educator, my experience of the greatest teachers that have ever worked for me and I've worked with, they are masters of relationship. They're masters of caring about their students and knowing who they are and reaching them where they are. And some of that stuff, I think, is gonna be pretty hard for AI to replicate. And I, I just think that there's the human touch that is, I, you can probably, the folks in the room can probably think about who's the teacher who had the biggest impact on my life. And it's almost always centered around a relationship. I think there's a lot of nodding, but if anyone wants to add anything there. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I just think about it. It's like, you can't replace human com relationships. And it's like, uh, there was that psychology uh, study when they replaced a mom with a, a wire and then like a blanket or something, and then all those monkeys became like s insane. So it, I just don't think you can replace something that's so fundamental as a teacher and that relationship that they have in person also um, with students with anything than an AI could ever do. And I would just add that like, unless you're at a world of AGI or like truly superhuman intelligence, which is kind of a different world than the one we're living in now, there's always a higher level thing that a teacher can be doing. So for example, I learned Arabic on my own, just using a dictionary. And a dictionary is like a very dumb AI. And it turns out I had problems with my accent, my grammar, they were pretty bad. Um, when I went to learn Chinese, I learned it with a teacher. And so that helped a lot. I had better accent, better grammar, etc. Now when I learn Chinese, I'm actually using ChatGPT rather than a tutor. But I still go to a real tutor to talk about the cultural implications of like a given page, to talk about how I should use a certain Cheng Yu like in context in a way that like GPT still isn't able to help me to do that. And 
you know, AI is only going to be able to get to those really high order things when it is like truly AGI. And so teachers are always going to be there. Be there. They're just going to be moving up that chain of very simple tasks to more complex and more complex tasks. And that's what we want, I think. I like that as an optimistic end to, the, to what we see in the future of education. So I just want to say thank you to all three of you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Adil, for making the time today and sharing your perspectives on where education is headed.